Hey, put the tissues away for a moment. <laughs> uh, that was I Carry You With Me, uh, a truly beautiful, emotional film. I'm David Canfield with Entertainment Weekly. Um, and I'm joined now by the film's director, Heidi Ewing, and star Armando Espitia. Um, thank you both so much for being here, for sharing this film with us. Uh, it's had a long road from Sundance. It'll be released uh, early next year by Sony Pictures Classics. Um, for me, this film is best when you go in not really knowing what to expect. <laughs> and I certainly didn't the first time I watched it. And I wanted to start there, Heidi. What was this process like? Um, obviously, based in such a true story, creating a narrative film, how did it evolve for you and, and how did it come to be this film? The first word that came to my mind when you said, what was this process like? That came into my head was endless. <laughs> <laughs> If that's the word that came in, I wrote endless, but then that's not the answer. So um, it was organic for sure. That is true. I hate that word. It's overused that word, but um, you know, when, when Ivana had the first, they're old friends of mine. And when they first told me their life story, which was like seven years after I met them, I, I learned their full story. Um, my first instinct was because I make documentaries that I should start making a documentary about them. But it, it came clear pretty soon that um, this deserved a narrative treatment. It's a very um, sort of epic and layered film. It takes place over many, many generations. It's very hard to do that in documentary film or do it well. And I didn't want to make a mediocre documentary film. I'd rather not make it at all. So I had the choice of either um, sort of starting going down a narrative road with a screenplay or not making the film. Um, but I also couldn't stop filming them. So I basically tried to have it both ways, which is I continued to film them over many years at high points in their, at, well, high and low points in their life, opening of restaurants, the death of a parent, decisions being made with immigration attorneys, things that you see in the film. I, I live close to them and I, I started to film them. Hmm. And was it research? Was it for the eventual use in the film? I left that open. Uh, but I couldn't stop shooting them even when I decided I was going to make a narrative. And so what you see in the film was a decision to not cast older actors to play them. Instead, just to leave the material that I had shot, the real material, Cinema Verite. Um, so it was, you know, how much was going to be in the film, when the documentary was going to appear, was all sort of left for later on in the process. And it changed a lot in the edit as well. So um, really it was, uh, I couldn't justify casting older actors to play them. I also thought it would be very difficult to age Armando and to age Christian into the older versions of them. That often does not work for me when I watch a film. I think it's very difficult for an audience and for an actor to do that. Um, so I just felt that leaving the authentic real scenes in there, um, also brings home the reality of, of, you know, being an immigrant in this country, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm. So Armando, what was it like for you playing someone who not only is alive and is, is a real person, but who would, you, you would in a way become in the film? That's kind of tricky, huh? Uh, it could be, but it wasn't actually. Heidi just guide me through a path where we, uh, where I, wouldn't feel um, with an extra pressure upon me because like making a movie is a, itself something important for an actor. So she just um, put away the, the extra pressure on me because she wanted to um, base my work in, uh, in the script because she already with Ivan and Gerardo, with Alan Page, they um, already have created a great character on the script. So we based our work there on the script. And then we just, I mean, it's not, I was not their friend before this. So um, are you guys, can you guys see me? Mm -hmm. I just, los perdí a los dos. No, te veo sin problema. Oh, okay. Uh, so as I as I wa as I was not their friend, I didn't have this uh, pressure on me of thinking and then liking the movie. I think that's Heidi's job. 
<laughs> I think you're right about that. <laughs> I, mean, Hi, we're, we're, now, I mean, now we're friends and we have never talk about if, if Ivan likes my performance. Like he knows, I, I know he can feel the respect uh, that I have for his story, for his life story. And I know he can feel that I tried very hard to honor him and honor a lot of uh, people who went through similar stuff like, like them. Mm -hmm. So Heidi, what, what was that pressure like for you? I imagine the balance of making what is uh, by and large your first narrative film with and we have a special guest <laughs> who has entered the frame uh, with um, the bounces of telling their story. What, what was that like for you? And were there difficulties, I suppose, in finding that balance? Well, we had some, like, we had to set some parameters. Otherwise, it would have been a paralyzing experience to make the film because I knew there were going to be things in the film that they didn't like or were uncomfortable with. So they never read the script. They never asked to read the script. Um, and I think that was better uh they trusted me and they knew that it was going to be a very yeah um complicated process to figure out this narrative so i think they realized that it would be harmful to the movie i really do think they they knew it would be harmful if they were asking too many questions um they were not involved in the casting process um once i cast the actors i sent them a, a you know i was in mexico i sent them a picture of each person i i really once i got to mexico for pre-production there was very little contact we had to find a way to that i i could make the movie i wanted to make without second guessing would they hate it would they hate me um every 5 minutes it would have been impossible so luckily you know over many many years of conversations and you know, filming and then not filming. And I was writing and then I made other films. They really sort of um, got used to the fact that this was going to be uh, a process they, that they, they would have involvement in, but not full involvement in. Um, I was very nervous to finally show them the final film, of course. Um, they were in shock. It took them multiple viewings to be able to respond. Um, they loved the film. They, um, they love the performances. They're proud of it. Their mothers have just, Yvonne's mother has just seen it in Mexico City two weeks ago. So, um, you know, it, the process continues because now their friends and family get to see it. So they get all kinds of different reactions. So it's a living, for them, it's like a living document. And it's, um, it's a way for them to explain to a lot of family members what their life has been like in the last 20 years because it's not something that they speak a lot about. Mm. To them. Mm. Um what about this being your first narrative feature um was new for you you know on, on the basics of filmmaking in addition to you telling uh these these men's story you're also moving into a new mode what was that like um well you know in the um in the scripting process the early versions of the script i was doing um too much telling like the actors were having conversations uh, explaining things to each other, like in a documentary, people explain their past. And I was like, I, I can just, I can just cast a 10 year old and I can show the, I can show the audience what, happened. you know, there was that like jump of like, well, I don't have to have him say when I was 10 years old, my father caught me. No, no, no. I'm going to just, guess what? I'm going to film it. So there was like that. It seems silly. Right. But there was that first moment in the, in the writing where I realized I had all this freedom. I could just show. And then in the end, I ended up um, embracing that so much. If ever we could just show it, even without dialogue, we would do it. I just got my final script back. I, I wrote a 112 page script. The final script of the movie that we made is 68 pages. <laughs> and the movie is 112 minutes. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> it's a full thing. Why? because we got rid of so much dialogue. It's like, if it didn't need to be spoken, if it could be shown, we did that. And that was a lot, a big credit to the actors in the film. Um, we worked a lot with Armando and Christian, all the actors, like if, if I could find a way, if we could find a way to show it and not say it, we, we did that. And so it was really that process of embracing what a narrative can give you, which is that freedom to show 
all those details that you could miss in a documentary film that you weren't there for, you came too late, it happened before you got there, all those things that we react to as documentary filmmakers, there's a lot less reactivity in making a narrative than, than in a documentary. Um, you have more control over the process, um, but you, but you still want to find those improvisational moments. You still want to find the magic. You will still want to surprise the actors. And so it was trying to maintain that surprise from documentary with, with, with a level of visual control that narrative offers. So I tried to not run away from my documentary instincts at all. And I didn't want the camera to anticipate the action too much. Um, there wasn't a lot of blocking. There wasn't, we would shoot the rehearsal. I mean, we, we really, we didn't, you know, the camera was rolling almost the minute that the gentleman would get onto the set because I was always afraid of losing that. Maybe the first performance was going to be the best one. So, um, you know, I was trying to sort of have it a little bit both both ways. But um, I love the experience visually. I'm I'm very comfortable technically and with the, that wasn't an issue. The shot listing and the visuals, that wasn't like scary because that's something I've always been deeply interested in. The most scary thing for me was working with actors. I'd never done it. So that was where I was the most shy and I was the most like nervous um, because it was totally new. Um, and so that took some getting used to. Like the first day on set, my producer walked up to me and she said, you have to talk to the actor. It was con Arcelio, no? Dice que a veces necesita hablar contigo. And I, I was like, but she's doing fine. No, no, pero necesita que tú le hables. I was like, okay, I, like you have to go talk to her. It was so strange. Like the first day I was very shy and nervous. I don't know if people could tell, but I was. So that was, that was a learning curve. No, you weren't shy at all. You weren't. Contigo, <laughs> <laughs> no. Maybe not with you. No, but it, and also it, it felt like a very playful, very uh, joyful process because uh, there are always new stuff to do and new ways to do the same stuff. So it was it's every time something different to play with, with Heidi. Mm. Armando, so much of the film, as Heidi mentions, sort of hinges on, you know, so the way you look at Christian or, or the way a scene feels, and you know, even though it's very quiet, what, what was that like for you as an actor? finding your way into what is a very, I think, impressionistic and um, and very, you know, some kind of a mood piece as a film. I mean, it, it, it's always interesting to make connections with people, uh, even if it's in, in fiction or in reality. So with Christian, I think we have a, a connection. I don't know in which level, I don't know how to name it, but we have a connection. And it was uh, Heidi who saw it. Uh, and I could feel it if, uh, from the from the start. And now we're we're very good friends, and we had to we had to open up, like we just had to feel free of giving uh, something to the other one. So it was actually easy, and um, I'm grateful just to have a partner like him, that so generous and so open to again to play and to. Just discover new stuff in between us and with the with the other aspects of the movie. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm just discovering right now and realizing that it is an important part. It's it's like the main part of our performances, the chemistry between the two of us. Uh, it is it is kind of crazy because people is saying, "Oh, there are nice performances, good performances," but it is because there's this chemistry, and it was Heidi who who saw it first. Mm. Chemistry, it's, it's such an amazing thing that, that I learned the term chemistry casting because Armando was cast first uh, as Ivan um, a long, a while before uh, I found Christian. And then we went looking for his mate or, you know, his, his love. And it was difficult because there were some amazing actors, excellent actors that we put up with Armando. And I just didn't feel it. I think he didn't feel it. It was, mm. uh, it was a different kind of problem. It wasn't just finding another excellent actor. It was like finding a believable connection between two people. And that's so amorphous. It's so, it's like hard to, it's like hard to bottle it. Hard to find it, just, it name it, you know? It just happens. And, and, when you, and when you notice that it's happening, you as an actor has to open some doors and just let this thing be. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, Heidi, this story by its 
very nature has this sort of epic feel and the film has a sweep and a, a sort of almost a convention conventionality in the way we think of romantic stories but in this case with people who are not normally at the center of those films um can you talk about telling the story in that way and um particularly giving this love story that kind of sweep you know, it's interesting because there are, it's a very, in, 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 in some ways it is a very traditional romantic film. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 um, I, I embrace that because there's so much about it that's different, but there, there is sort of that treatment of um, that first blush of love and obsession with another person. And, um, but undocumented immigrants uh, in, in our, aren't given that treatment, at least in American films. Uh, I don't know why. Everybody falls in love. You know, everybody gets homesick. Everybody has regrets. So who gets to fill the shoes of those romantic objects, those romantic is somehow left to mostly privileged characters. And um, I'm not sure why that is, because when I first heard the story of how, how Ivana Gerardo met and he was like, I was a teacher, so I had a laser pointer and I was in my clothes from work and then I saw him and I thought, oh, that would be cute. So I pulled it and the whole story was like so romantic and so sweet and so clever. And I, it was like one of the most, it was like one of the best stories I ever heard, really, the whole thing. And um, it, I had, it had to be told. Um, I didn't really realize till the film came out that it was such it was so radical to see um, undocumented men or um, you know lower middle class men from Mexico in these roles. I didn't even think that they wouldn't deserve the epic treatment just because the way they told it to me was was so large that it didn't strike me until people started seeing it and they were so surprised to see. Um, men and from the socioeconomic background placed in those roles. So I guess that really caught me a little bit off guard. I did realize, of course, that this was an immigrant story from Mexico that had nothing to do with narcos, <laughs> that had nothing to do with rape and murder, that had nothing to do with, um, you know, a violent death of a family member. So all of the immigrant side, I, I definitely was very attracted to the fact that this was an, an immigrant narrative that was real and true and didn't have those expected elements. So that meant a lot to me. I thought that's a surprise. Hmm. That's a surprise to, for, that will be a surprise. Uh, and I hope a wonderful surprise to audiences to see the immigrant experience from Mexico to the United States in this way. And the film also ends in New York City, which most of these narratives end up in Texas or Arizona or California. It's like the fact that it was like the sparkle of New York City and the restaurant world was just like, it's true, but it was also surprising. So I guess it's like turning a traditional narrative a little bit on its head um, with those aspects included. Mm, yeah, I think once you realize that it's a true story, you kind of you realize how radical it is in its, in its very existence. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I want to ask both of you about um, the border crossing scenes because um, within a film that deals with a multitude of issues, I think these are handled with a particular delicacy. And I imagine um, an element of research that it would require to make sure you're, you're getting that um, experience right. Um, Heidi, I'll start with you. What did you look into to make sure you depicted that as authentically as possible, in addition, of course, to these men's experiences? Well, I'm an American woman, uh, and uh, I was definitely very concerned about details and getting these stories right, especially something that's been seen so often as a border crossing. So I, that, that was sort of one of those things where you don't want to get caught like flipping and making doing the wrong thing. The whole movie was like that. So it was a combination of um, many conversations, transcripts, um, and ha having it told over and over and over again from Yvonne of exactly what happened, how it happened, what everybody looked like. Then it was talking to the production designer 
um, and the props people about exactly what kind of cars, what kind of trucks would be used in that era. Um, that you know the the bridge the the falling off the bridge of El Paso that was a direct experience that had been told to me. It was like all hands on deck in terms of how many people would be traveling, how old were they, what was the coyote like, what was the, you know obviously I took creative license all over the place. I mean my coyote, the one that I cast, I told them you're all business. His direction was this is business. It's a businessman. Let's move it. Let's keep going. Your business business. So, you know, you, you choose roles or you choose a way for people to speak. But um, it was a, a tremendous amount of, of research and then relying on the 100 percent Mexican cast and crew um, and producers who had experience with these things to make sure that every aspect was true and was believable. Um, you know, so that was something where I relied often very, very heavily um, and and happily on the the Mexican professionals that were making this movie with me. Um, I it was there was a lot of conversations about also the era. Would this word be used? Did they say the word chilo in 1994? Did they say that you know it was always like research? And so I think that the I feel like the crew and the cast were especially meticulous because I asked them to be, but also because they didn't want to be making a film with an American director that didn't, that seemed fake. Like nobody wanted to sort of be part of that at all. Um, and so in me neither. So it was, it was a constant conversation and the desert crossing was, was no different. Um, also working with Juan Pablo Ramirez, my excellent, excellent cinematographer. Um, how much light would there be in the sky? Was it a night with a moon? If there were a half moon, how would the light look? Where should the crane be? What should that like? It was like, you know, just bear everything down to the mint, to the, the minutia of like, how would it look? How would we capture it on camera? And so really it was across every single department head, um, the clothing, who would wear what? I mean, kind of boots. I mean, it, it, was, it was extremely specific. Mm. Armando, for you, embodying that journey, what was that like? First, I must say that um, as, as a Mexican man coming from the background I came, you don't need to do that much research because you, are, you grew up uh, hearing those stories from people you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, maybe that's why we were very helpful, I hope, with Heidi. Because we know those stories, we know the people who went through those kind of stories. So we wanted to really bring the the essence of that moment in someone's life, uh, and then portraying it like it's so so hard just to be in front of the emptiness and, and huge spaces, empty spaces, uh, dangerous places. It, it was um, it was hard. As, as an actor and as uh, an actor playing this character, just to be in this uh, edge of something, like just not knowing what's next uh, and what are your choices because you don't have any. It's, uh, I'm sure I, I've never went through this myself, but I'm sure it's kind of a life-changing moment just to be in the middle of nowhere with a lot of risk around you. Uh, and it still gives me like chill like, no sé cómo se dice, escalofríos, uh, chills, uh, thinking about that. Because there's still, right now, a lot of people doing that, like right now, uh, in this is exact moment. So it's, it's, it's not fair uh, um, for us, people making this moment more difficult for them. So hmm. in addition... Yep. I remember Juan Pablo said to me, like people knew what the crossing looked like, but there was like up to a point, you know, like my cinematographer was like, I don't know, Heidi, would that woman in the United States give them water and the bananas and stuff? I said, yes. I said, this, this, I can tell you for sure. Don't worry. This happens all the time. There's people who have crossed before, who are on the border, who give, who have, they even go looking for people to help. I said, they always have water and a lot of people have food and water in the car. Cause he was like, no say, I don't know. I, this, this doesn't seem like possible. So it was funny because I was like, 
once it got to the U.S., I was like, I got this. This I know for sure happened. <laughs> it was like, you know, I promise you. So it was like that conversation as well of like, up to what point do we do we have knowledge? So together, we were able to make something believable. Um, of course, the ending indicates how this is a story that doesn't ever quite end. They're, they're the consequences of, of these decisions reverberate today. Heidi, I wanted to ask first about that as, as a narrative um, part of the film and really the way it does communicate that, that their story is ongoing uh, and how that felt like the right ending to you. Um, uh, you know, it was so funny because I did a Q&A with Korea, with South Korea two days ago, and the moderator said, if, if you could end the movie any way you wanted, if you, if, you, if you just had written the whole thing in narrative, how would it end? And I was like, oh my God, I hadn't been asked that question. And when I thought about it, I said, he would go home to Mexico. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. And he would leave Gerardo in New York. Mm. I said, that, that's how it would end. It was a much sadder ending, actually, than the real one that I did. <laughs> so thank God I didn't do that, because it, it's I would have gone for that. Um, but instead, I decided to stick with the dream. I, I decided to stick with the ambiguity with like, Mexico's out there for me one day, and I'm going to keep dreaming about it. I'm going to keep talking about it. I'm going to keep telling myself I'm going back, even though I may never go there. So I decided to go with, I feel like it's very poignant because it's also true. I saw them three nights ago, and Yvonne still saying he's going to go back before Christmas. He won't. He won't go back before Christmas. So it's it's the truest. It's the truest, and it's the most purgatorial. And But it's so, so many people identify with it. So many, you know, um, immigrants of, of all stripes and colors and backgrounds have said to me, I identify with that, like, one day. One day I'm going to go back and it's going to be just like I left it. I won't. So you've got the dream, you've got the hope, and that's why the hakaranda is in the end and you see what it's going to be like if I went back and I'm going to be young again. It's, 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 um, I, I, I love the ending because um, it, it's painful, but it's painfully beautiful. And um, I think there's that purgatory that millions of people live in. For sure. Hmm. So maybe this ending is the ending you would choose in the end. <laughs> I think I chose the right ending. <laughs> I think you did too. Just the right thing instead of making it so, um, yeah, I, I think I'm happy with the ending. Hmm. Uh, Armando, I'll give you the last word on this. I, I'm curious, putting this film out to the world, doing conversations like this, what do you hope? Um, viewers take away and, and what have you taken away from this experience both the filming of it and, and now having people react to it and, and having this film um, touch so many people it's this, this process this moment in the process is very special for me because you got uh, the chance to rethink what you what you did like first you analyze or explore a material which is the script and then you shoot it and then Heidi and the editor and explore and play with it and finally i got to play and rethink and say things about the job we did uh, that i left a few months ago so it's interesting always uh, came back to the to the process and listen to the people for me the most important so far opinions have came from people in mexico from mexican people because i now i'm so um, glad that people in Mexico feel it in a feel it in a different way. Like we know we belong there, and that story belongs to us. Because even my parents and my brothers and my family, they knew they saw our family reflected in those characters. Because uh, el machismo is something that lives so deep inside us in every little particle of, of Mexican society. Even though it's not violent or physically violent uh, against um, some of us, it is there. It's always there, el machismo, and then the homophobia uh, too. So that is the, the, 
that is why my character is just li- just leave and and leave everything behind. So I think Mexican people will relate very very deeply with this story because of that because we can feel it. We don't understand it, but we can feel it. <laughs> Maybe we cannot understand it fully, but we can feel it, and we know it's like it's true. It's happening, uh, and it's interesting because I I understand that that we live in this society which is beautiful with beautiful talented creative people all around lo- lovely people but also we have uh, things to work on um yeah i think i'm, I'm so focused on mexican people but i, I think it's the, it will be the same for everybody i guess i hope <laughs> i'm so happy to hear this i'm always looking on twitter mexican twitter and putting the movie in in spanish and seeing what they say <laughs> care about it a lot of course yeah uh, well i think that's a lovely note to end on thank you both so much for your film and for talking with us today the film is i carry you with me uh, and thanks everyone for watching i'm david canfield with entertainment weekly <laughs>